I don't come from a very musical family. In fact, none of the family are musicians. No. None at all. And so really, the, the, uh, um, the, the development of music came from listening to my father's uh, old 78s. We were lucky enough to have a gramophone in our bedroom and every Saturday morning when it used to rain, we used to put these uh, uh, gramophone records on, you know, old 78s with a big, uh, big uh, six inch nail for a mm -hmm. stylus. Um, and that's how the musical sort of uh, influences started off, really, isn't it? So uh, it's all time sort of uh, big band set. And I think really the very first, I mean, I was, the Beatles, we sat on the chairs, we pretend had our play, <laughs> ten guitars, and we played like this sort of thing, you know, like the Beatles and the podiums and Dave Clark Five and the tremolos and people like that. But I think the, the very first real song I actually sort of, wow, made me feel something's going on here, was actually quite a strange one, it was Millie and My Boy Lollipop which at the time was a, quite a, a, a groundbreaking record because it was the first scar come sort of uh, blue beat record to ever, ever make the top of the charts and of course number one it stayed for a few weeks. So there on I was all more or less sort of uh, tuned into sort of what music was going on, probably a bit more middle of the road pop music. Uh, then I heard things like, like uh, uh, Little Red Rooster from the Rolling Stones because they had this wonderful sound, this, this, this thing called slide guitar which I've never ever seen before or heard before apart from listening to some of the old uh, Les Paul stuff which my father had on the, uh, on, on the gramophone records. But the real sort of big crunch came when I started at secondary school, or comprehensive school as it was called in those days, you know, uh, at the Chase over at Malvern. And all of a sudden I was thrown, this country boy coming on the, on the country bus, all of a sudden thrown into this sort of huge sort of mixture of styles of music and influences from all over the place, you know, and uh, whether or not you were sort of a of a skinhead sort of a background, or whether you were more of a hippie sort of thing, all of a sudden you became aware that there was a lot of music going on. And uh, that was really quite an interesting time. And um, travelling to work, uh, sorry, 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 work travelling mm. to school on the, on the country bus, we used to listen to sort of have Terry Wogan in the morning and then Pete Murray coming home at night. And in between those two sort of times you, you got to talk to people about sort of music and uh, what style of music and you kind of got regimented into these camps either you're a boot boy with your sort of a scar kind of sort of soul sort of stuff you know or you were sort of like the hippie sort of area or in the middle of the middle road sort of thing where you were listening to the sort of stuff as I was listening to at the time like the Beatles and things like that so. So you were more of the middle of the road at that point? At that point I was yeah I think I think my first real sort of uh, um, sandwich really got me I think it was Mungo Jerry in the, in the summer time, which was, uh, was a song which was completely different to me, because once again it still had that sort of reggae sort of style feel to it, uh, which obviously had some influences later on in my life, but um, uh, as far as the listener was concerned. Um, but certainly um, that was a, a time when uh, it, it felt there was something happening. T-Rex came along and all the others came along, and then gradually I started listening to you know, influenced by these other bands. Um, such as uh, you know Evans and Palmer and uh, and uh, you know sort of Black Sabbath and, uh, and Jethro Tull and uh, you know, and bands like that gradually over the years uh, as, I, as I moved up, up up into the school and then uh, things like you know so sort of Redbone as well at that time uh, you know, who, who is band Redbone where are they from you know <laughs> and uh, it, obviously listening through the radio and, and of course then programs like uh, the Old Grey Whistle Test which was starting up and. Um, listening to that and watching that whenever I could because we didn't have BBC Two until in our house until around about sort of uh, 1971 I think it was we actually had a black and white television set with BBC Two on. <laughs> <laughs> Steve gave up with making his guitar and he bought one and so <laughs> I decided to follow suit and I talked to talk my parents and of course my dad was totally against this absolutely and utterly he would not be interested unless I played like Hank Marvin. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll try and play that on mark. But you're not having an electric guitar, you're having one of those wooden box things. So I ended up going to his catalogue and finding uh, the, the best looking guitar, which was probably the most awful guitar I ever had. But my very first guitar was a K guitar, cost £23. And, uh, and uh, it looked like a, a Gibson Dreadnought at the time, but it played like a plank of wood, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but, but there, the start of the sort of influence where Steve had electric guitar, I had acoustic and I was really sold on being an acoustic player. Uh, I did buy electric guitars but I never felt comfortable with electric guitars and uh, so I always try to sort of um, uh, move along with a, a, an acoustic or a semi-acoustic in, in some respects. And that, that's how we started playing in Steve's back shed, uh, me on the acoustic sort of strumming away, he playing all these fancy riffs and chords and things like that. I was quite happy to sort of strum. Was he good then? 
Sorry? Was he good? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we both learned together. And um, in fact, it was Steve who actually made the move to uh, um, go and see a guy called Paul White, who uh, everybody knows from Sound on Sound. And, and, uh, and at, the, at the time, he was playing in a band called Peak Band. And that was his sort of band. And they're very much a blues sort of uh, kind of sort of, I don't know, that sort of rock sort of style things of, of the time. And, um, and it was great. I mean, we used to toddle along to Paul's every Wednesday night up to his flat whilst he's making his curry and whatever else. He, uh, we sat in the corner and uh, he showed us a few chords. You know, we started off doing the House of the Rising Sun, you know, and, uh, and sort of stuff like that. So we had this sort of bounce off where Steve was playing the riffs and I was playing the chords. And, and that's how we, we developed. And, and then round about sort of, I must be 72. And around about the end, end of that summer, towards the summer holidays, Paul White suddenly announced to us that we were playing a gig. Right. And the band was called? And, well, at that time, <laughs> it was just me and Stephen. He said, you will, of course, need a bass player. So uh, I was thinking, well, who should we drag in for a bass player? We didn't know anybody. And fortunately enough, uh, there's a good friend of mine, Andy, Andy Staples, who I later worked with in Marty Van Moon. Uh, he came and joined in and bought himself an Avon uh, bass guitar, very good precision copy, and uh, there we were a three piece, a three piece, and we our very first gig was I think uh, sometime in August at the Lamb in West Malvern, at the half time slot between the pew band having a rest when they were having a rest and having a few beers, um, the No Man's Band as we were called because we couldn't think of the name of it, <laughs> No Man's Band, um, it was the actual sort of half time slot, slot, and we started off doing thing, um, we, I think we did three numbers. Or was it four numbers? I think. Uh, hey Joe, I remember one of them. Uh, Dear Mr. Fantasy, yeah, you see, we're, we're, we're sort of moving down sort of that sort of yeah. bounce off line, sort of two, two guitars and uh, bass. Um, I can't remember that, but the third one, I remember we wrote one, and this is where for this time we actually wrote a song together, and it was, we didn't have a name for it, it was, um, and I wrote some very, very basic lyrics. It was a blues song. I have played this in the past, quite recently, in fact. But uh, it's something I try, to try not to sort of dig out too much, and uh, we call it Mr. White's Blues, uh, because <laughs> obviously, <laughs> and uh, that's how we sort of moved on from uh, that, that sort of uh, uh, sort of first gig, and I was absolutely, uh, utterly petrified. You know, I stood, I sat there because we all sat down, and I'm looking at this audience, and all these people were expecting us to start, and we were going, "How do we start?" <laughs> and then. Steve said, one, two, three, we started off, <laughs> and that's how we got going. <laughs> I think the first number we played at sort of a, you know, a sort of an allegro of sort of, a, I don't know what it was, it's was, it was pretty fast timing anyway. <laughs> the Lamb Inn, how long had that been going at that point? Some years oh, ago, I, I, did, I did, I don't know, it must have been some years before that. Um, and, and it's, of course, it had various keepers before us, it sadly closed a, a couple of years ago. Um, and in those, it was basically, in those days, it was basically the institution to go to and play at, mm. and that was the place to be. Uh, and there was another place in Malvern called the Nags Tail, which was the, 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 now is the restaurant of the Nags Head in Malvern. That was a, a venue. And that was quite a cute little venue, actually, because um, <laughs> on Sundays you used to have folk nights there. And also you used to have uh, nights when you do readings. And I remember sort of popping along there, cycling over from Worcester, and then going to these sort of evenings there. And they'd have things like readings of The Hobbit. And somebody would sit there, sound that sit there and read you know, sort of like, uh, episodes from The Hobbit, and then we got to Lords of the Rings and, and all the other sort of really sort of, hey, far out sort of stuff. Wow. But, uh, but that's what Morgan was like. It was, it was, you know, uh, at that time, and I said, I think it's, so it's a very arty, mm. a very sort of, um, uh, sort of progressive sort of, in, in every respect, uh, a community. As well, is venues do seem to come and go, and if you, if you haven't known about the history, you just go, well, that's another one that's popped up and gone. Yeah. But when, when they've got a history that's going back 30, 40 plus that's years, right. that, that is a shame. It, it? it is a shame to lose that, and, and, uh, and, uh, and we've got to be careful about that, and I think this is where musicians at the moment really have got to sort of think about, not just it, it, the place is a place to perform, but it has the culture there, and you've got to bring that culture on. You are part of the culture, you are part of that. That important development of that venue. Uh, one of the venues what I really, really do miss in Worcester is the old Rectifying House. I love that upstairs room, not only from a sound engineer's point of view, not only from a promoter's point of view, but also from a performer's point of view, because it is absolutely stunning. It's got a lovely wooden floor, and it and it just has everything about it as a great acoustic gig venue. 
Uh, another place which sadly has never ever opened is, is the ballroom in, in the in the Crown Inn in, in Broad Street. That's got a wonderful wooden floor. And of course, if you go back and look at the history of that place, of course, that was a, a very much a, a, a dance dance hall place of the 30s and the 40s. It really has a lot of history, but unfortunately, it's it's now much of a nightclub mm. more than anything else. But what I've really got to sort of appreciate the things like the, the Firefly. You've got to appreciate things like you know, a place like. Um, you know, O'Neill's and, and Drummond's and, and the Pig and Drum, and all those places, you, you, you've, got to, you've got to sort of support them, be there as a musician, and the punters as well, really, you've got to be there and uh, do their thing, and come along and enjoy the music there. Because once it's gone, it's gone. Mm. And we're seeing a lot of closures of pubs at the moment, an awful lot of closures yeah, of pubs, and clubs. Evolution, that was a cracking place for metal bands. Where are they going to go now? The only place they can really go and play is a bass in, in, in Starbridge. There's very little, few, few places where metal bands can really apply their trade. So you're 16, No Man's Band. How long did that last for? And how many gigs did you do? Ha no Man's Band lasted until 1980, in various forms. That's good. The, 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 three, the three of us stayed together until about 1980. Uh, uh, and and uh, Andy, Steve's brother, joined on drums. We morphed from No Man's Band because we found there was a band in Wales called No Man's Band. Uh, so we, we, we changed the name to Saga because of Steve, Andy, Gary and Andy, which then somebody pointed out that was an old person's sort of uh, it, it institution. It used to be a hit record label as yes, well. Yes, as well, it? Saga <laughs> Records, yes, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think they used to make them on granite. That's right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very much so. And so we, we, we decided, no, that wasn't going to be for us. Uh, and then by this time, we were in 1974, 75, we, we kept, Andy was a big fan of Humble Pie. And so am I. I'm mean, great, great. I mean, great. Steve Marriott is probably the best, best singer we've ever, ever, soul singer we've ever had a hand in this country. People say Tom Jones was, but Marriott was just a, a class on his own. And one of the albums of, of uh, Humble Pie was called Thunderbox. And we thought, this is what we want. Because a Thunderbox, of course, is a, a World War II toilet. <laughs> <laughs> right. As you probably did. <laughs> <laughs> so the band became Thunderbox, and that was the name which we howled. For many many years, uh, until sort of things had to change. So by that time, the music was actually morphing in from, let's say, a very basic sort of um, uh, um, youngsters band in, into something a lot tighter, and we were moving down the road of, um, uh, let's say, blues, but mainly sort of Americana blues, as you would call it now, but a straight southern rock sort of style, the Leonard, Leonard Skinner sort of Allman Brothers sort of style music. Those influences were very very big, you know, uh, and. and that kind of pushed us along. We, we became a really, really tight musical unit. I mean, people would say you could cut it, everything was sharp and, 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 and tight. But of course, we were so intense on that sort of sound, we, we forgot this, the stagecraft, and people obviously want to be entertained. And we were very much like Caravan. We suddenly sort of stuck into this music. No, no real emotion as such, but we were very tight. People liked what we did, but we were never, ever going to get a booking where, where we could actually sort of uh, hold an audience down and I think that was one of our downfalls of that particular time.